Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this special EOL seminar. I want to thank everyone for taking the time to come to the seminar uh, this afternoon. This is a little bit out of the normal sequence uh, as far as the different seminars we do. Um, the seminar on MODIS is to really give an overview to all EOL staff as far as uh, what is MODIS, what's the science motivation uh, behind it, uh, very much where do we stand today, and what is the future for MODIS, some of the challenges um, we have. Um, if you look in EOL, APAR has been a major development for many, many years now. And if we look to VOTUS, VOTUS is the next uh, big thing uh, within EOL as far as instrumentation and capabilities and supporting the EO, uh, NSF University uh, community. Um, come on. Uh, first thing too, I just kind of want to point out is who is on the actual um, MODIS team? We meet bi-weekly. Um, I am the PI, but we have two co-PIs, the science leads, both uh, Tammy and Steve. And then the current members here in 2020 is with Vonda, Bill Brown, Britt Stevens, Wen Chow. And we have two uh, postdocs, uh, part of the MODIS team, Jun Young K, who is working with Tammy, and Josh Gabar, uh, who just joined us about a week from uh, today, that's also part of the uh, MODIS team. And then just a special note too, is I also listed Allison Rockwell, where she was actually the project manager for um, MODIS in 2018, 2019. She is currently not part of the team, but she certainly made significant contributions uh, the first couple of years of the uh, MODIS effort. Uh, if we look at MODIS, what is it? Um, and this is where we're really looking at what can we do to improve the understanding of the uh, boundary layer? So it's really, proposed to be a configurable and scalable integrated suite of instrumentation. Um, what's a little bit different here with MODIS compared to what we are doing, have been doing with all of our ground-based instrumentation and EOL, but is to have it be unattended um, using in situ sensors and remote sensors. And we'll go uh, into quite a bit more detail as far as what that means. But if we look at the scientific goal for VOTUS in terms of what we're trying to achieve, we're really trying to give a complete picture of a 3D environment in the boundary layer, um, including the kinematic and thermodynamic um, understanding of this uh, boundary layer environment. And then the other key thing too, is we're really trying to look at the exchange processes across the land. And I actually threw in here uh, C, uh, there's certainly a scientific interest um, out over the oceans. Um, between the, inter the Earth's uh, interface and the boundary layer. Um, what have we been doing to date with VOTUS? Um, and it's actually been going on for several years now. And here's just a quick summary of the various activities. But back in 2019, in the spring of 2019, we did propose uh, a mid-scale um, MSRI to NSF. And this is really for us to do a uh, system design of what VOTUS is in terms of what's the appropriate instrumentation, what is it going to take for processing a large uh, number of uh, data sets, um, how do we bring in automation um, into it, but it's really to do a very detailed system design, both from an engineering standpoint and a scientific. Unfortunately, that proposal, why uh, there are many positive aspects that NSF liked about it, it was declined and there are some um, limitations in our proposal too, uh, which is what we are kind of working on um, right now to address those issues. Uh, the other thing that has taken place is there's been a Lotus white paper. Um, it's about a 25 plus page paper. We've already to date have, have had two internal reviews uh, from people outside of EOL, but within um, NCAR. And then we've also been very active in presenting MODIS at conferences and uh, various meetings um, for, for the uh, past two years. You can pretty much see a list from everything from AMS uh, to EGU and to uh, uh, several smaller um, conferences throughout the year, both at the domestic and international level. And then we've also been um, presenting to NOAA. Uh, they had an emergency technologies, emerging technologies workshop that we presented at. And certainly just recently, NASA was doing a tech, uh, technical survey of uh, instrumentation for the boundary layer. So we've also 
been doing that. So we've certainly been broadcasting the message of Lotus uh, to the community. There's certainly been incredibly positive uh, feedback uh, from the community to really push our understanding of the boundary layer. And with that, I am going to uh, let uh, switch over to Steve. Thanks, Terry, and thanks everyone for attending. Um, I thought I'd just start with an introduction to the boundary layer that we're trying to study. And I, I tend to start with just thinking of a simple calculus problem. I have a function dy dx equals a constant. And that in order to solve that problem, you need to know the value somewhere. And in this case, we choose uh, the value at, a, at one of the boundaries of the domain, which, which I'm saying x is equal to zero. And that allows you to solve that mathematical function. <laughs> For any fluid, and the atmosphere is included, the equation for the fluid motion is a lot more, differential equation for the fluid motion is a lot more complicated. Uh, the so-called, the Navier-Stokes equation uh, shows that the fluid motion, the change of fluid motion is a function of uh, pressure forcing, viscous forcing, and buoyancy. Um, it's, a really hard mathematical problem, uh, it basically because it has a derivative that's a, of the velocity that's a function of the second order derivative of the velocity, and so it's it's not a closed mathematical problem. Claude Louis Jean Navier came up with this, uh, at least started developing this equation in 1822. And uh, in the 200 years since, the best mathematicians in the world have worked on it and have not been able to come up with an analytical solution. Uh, there's actually, at the moment, kind of an X prize of a million dollars to anyone that can solve this problem or show that it can't be solved. Uh, so if you ever want an extra bit of cash, you can try to work on that in your spare time. But the way that we uh, make progress on the lower left uh, it, engineers have been working with uh, determining boundary layers and by studying what happens to that equation when you're close to the sur to a solid surface. And generally a no slip condition is assumed where the molecules of air that are in direct contact with the surface are assumed to not be able to move and therefore have zero velocity. And there's a transition from that state to an ambient flow condition. And the, as the, the fluid is sensitive to, uh, still feels the, the slowing down of the boundary layer, that's of, the bound, of boundary, that's called the boundary layer. And there's laminar parts of the boundary layer and turbulent parts of the boundary layer. So it, it becomes pretty complicated. It's of course really important for, I mean, that plate could be an airplane wing, it could be a wall of a pipe, could be the, the body of an Olympic skier. So anybody that wants to assume, wants to measure um, drag, for example, uh, through a fluid needs to know something about solving this equation of boundary layer. In the lower right, the problem with the atmosphere becomes more complicated because of the heating that occurs throughout the day. So in the rightmost part, like, there's an arrow for sunrise. And that at that point, of course, the surface of the Earth is heated by radiation from the sun. Uh, as that air becomes heated, it can rise uh, and mix and, and bump into the air above. Uh, there's an entrainment zone that's at the top of this mix, convective mix layer as, this, as the boundary layer grows. And that progresses all the way until sunset when that source of heating is turned off and actually through infrared ra radiative transfer, the, the ground starts cooling. Uh, that vertical motion is suppressed so that the night boundary layer that develops at nighttime is a lot shallower. Um, all of that is obviously pretty complicated. And so you might wonder why we even bother to, to study this, the flow, this type of flow in this condition. And Terry, next slide, please. So the, the, and the explanation for us is that the boundary layer, that 
where, which is the surface of the earth for us, uh, is where the atmosphere interacts with the other spheres of the earth. The lithosphere, which is rocks, um, what rocks get weathered by the atmosphere and, uh, and, and actually contribute uh, important chemicals to the atmosphere. The biosphere, of course, is pretty, pretty important uh, in the exchange of water both to, between the atmosphere and the biosphere both ways. Um, and of course, a number of chemical species, uh, including CO2 to do the carbon balance. There's the hydrosphere and the cryosphere, water in the two different phases that of course also uh, have important contributions back and forth with uh, water exchange to the atmosphere and including things just precip in, in cold weather and warm weather precip. And finally, there's what's called the anthrosphere, which is us. And uh, we of course live generally in the boundary layer because we generally are on the surface of the earth. Um, we build buildings that affects drag and albedo of, of the surface. Uh, heated buildings contribute heat to the locally. Um, and of course, uh, humans are really good at putting different kinds of chemicals in the atmosphere. So all of that occurs at the surface of the earth um, and is coupled through the boundary layer to, uh, to the atmosphere and get transported around the planet. So how would you and study that? We already know now that we can't analytically solve uh, all these problems. Uh, so obviously people like to model uh, the atmosphere and the boundary layer. Um, and that's, that's hampered by the fact that uh, the scales of motion exist over many uh, spatial scales uh, and it's still several orders of magnitude uh, more than the in the real atmosphere than you're capable of modeling. So we go to operation uh, observations. Next, Terry. And one simple way to study the atmosphere would be to just put a bunch of sensors that could look from the surface to the top of the boundary layer and actually through it. In this case, I drew the arrows just partway through just because it was simpler, but the boundary layer these are boundary layer clouds in this photo, and uh, the arrows should go all the way to through to and through the clouds. Um, so this is uh, one sampling strategy. You put a one set set of sensors in a dry dry plot of land. Um, there are some moist, some green and growing parts of the land, but. To my eye, the slope of the terrain is actually different. There might be a north-facing slope and a south-facing slope, and those might have different um, types of soil or, or um, exposure to the sun or different nutrients. And similarly, there's, this photo had a upland, woodland, and a low, and a woodland and a valley, and those might be expected to have different geology and soils and therefore productivity. So that's one way you could um, you could configure sensors to sample the boundary layer uh, next. Another way would be to focus sensors on a specific phenomena. In this case, I'm showing like an internal boundary layer that would be uh, formed by the air flowing from a cold and moist surface to a hotter and drier surface. It could also be along the line of a squall line or along the line of a, a drainage flow or, or land sea breeze or something. But so those would, that's obviously an important way to study uh, the boundary layer too, especially if you're interested in specific processes. Next. But we think we, there's a community, especially the modeling community that wants to know just the net effect over a grid box. And so I've just put a box here um, and next. So, you could study the amount of water vapor that accumulates within this box if you were to know the inflow and outflow of uh, water or, any, or anything you're interested in uh, through the sides and through the tops and bottom, top and bottom of the box. What you need to know here is not only the air flow in the direction that's perpendicular to that surface, um, which is horizontal on the sides and vertical in the top and bottom, 
but then you also need to know the concentration of whatever it is that you want to, to measure, temperature, um, moisture, CO2, methane, whatever. And so next, please. At the surface, it's relatively easy these days, although the, because of surface complexity, you may want to have a lot of measurements of the vertical velocity exchanged with uh, or correlated with uh, the what you're trying to what you're trying to to, to measure uh, at the same time. Uh, that those would be surface flux stations. Uh, next. And then the other part of the problem is trying to find out what happened within in the volume of the box. And one way to make that measurement is to put a, a fifth uh, set of instrumentation in the middle and next. And that actually has some advantages that you can then build sub boxes and try to determine the effect of sub regions. And that also uh, allows you to uh, do some checking some consistency checking. Sorry, I have an aircraft above me. Might, you might be able to hear. Um, and speaking of aircraft, we can go to the next slide. The other way you can find out what's going on in the volume of the box is to fly aircraft and, and UAVs at some, at, for small scales would be perfect for this or fleets of UAVs. Uh, obviously, my drawing isn't very good about the, the bends, but you get the idea that uh, they'd be able to sample uh, the entire volume and, uh, and also be able to measure species of things like methane for which there may not be a, a remote sensing way to, to measure. And next. So the question is, what should those red arrows consist of? What do you actually need to measure? Well, the first thing, of course, is the winds. And we have uh, already in the LA, LAOF uh, pool of instrumentation, uh, for radar wind profilers capable of measuring at pretty good resolution, temporal resolution in one minute and vertical re resolution on the order of 100 meters. And uh, that's very good at, at, measuring, at measuring the wind field to deploy them where you, Currently using a set of six, six, no, sorry, three hexagonal panels um, that are shown on the lower right. If you, if we need to, um, we could put out more panels, but uh, the three seems to be really good to get the entire all the way through the boundary layer. I guess I didn't say that the boundary layer typically is uh, one to two, sometimes three kilometers at its highest, and the. Uh, you can see the data that the radar wind profile is able to get to that height. Next. We also want to measure things like the humidity profile and uh, temperature profile. And both of these, we think this is example for humidity, but uh, temperature capability is coming online for the micropulse dial systems. And uh, we would anticipate using those as part of Lotus 2. Again, it, it has pretty good temporal resolution and uh, vertical resolution, which is similar. One problem with um, both the radar wind profiler and the MPD is a dead zone at the very bot at the lowest part, where in, in this case we only have humidity profiles down to about 500 meters above ground. So we're use so we're interested in. Uh, Load it for Lotus to get a complementary set of instrumentation to fill in those coverage gaps. Next. Um, that's not in the right position. <laughs> we have to figure, we have to fix that. Um, can you go to the next one, slide? Yeah. Um, so I already mentioned putting a set of surface flux towers like we'd have on the on the right side of this photo uh, that measure the fluxes of various things that we're interested in. Uh, the, all the surface towers would also have sensor optical distrometers for liquid and frozen precipitation and uh, various other things you'd expect from a weather station. In addition, on the left-hand side, I've shown that we now have 
a set of 30 meter towers that can be uh, erected fairly readily and you could instrument them at multiple levels to get a, a vertical profile again to try to fill in some of that vertical, vertical gap underneath the remote sensing profiles. Next. And finally, we want to add greenhouse gas um, sensors to measure the trans how those are transported and affected by the boundary layer. I've, the surface lux stations that we have currently uh, measure carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide fluxes. But we think we can add um, other sensors with uh, multiple inlets to measure a wide suite of, of gases. Methane is one obvious one. And the example, and those would also be deployed on at least a subset of the surface flux systems and also the flux profile tower uh, for the meter towers. So we can get uh, variations of the domain. Of course, if we were hoping at some point that we'd actually put um, uh, the ability to analyze greenhouse gases from the UASs that could be uh, part of a Lotus deployment. And with that, I think we're ready for Canada. Oh, so, sorry, no, this is me, <laughs> the last one. Uh, so yeah, that this just shows a little cartoon of uh, the ability of each one of those sensors to measure wind temperature humidity profiles. Um, and yeah, you'll you see that sort of toward the right, the air, an airy radi radiometer in com combination with the other measurements could be used to fill in uh, a measurement gap between the 30 meters of the towers and say 300 meters of the remote sensors. Uh, also GPS tomography all the way on the left can be used to, to measure the distribution of water vapor within a volume. And at that, I think we're ready for Tammy. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Steve. Hello, everybody out there. Thanks a lot for joining this seminar. So my part of the Lotus seminar is to talk about our ideas and examples related to Lotus data in general. Um, to start this, what I'd like to do is to use Gary Granger's summary of the software engineering developments that he's been he's put together. The, the, these are generally going to be needed to effectively and efficiently manage the data related aspects of the Lotus development. So I'm not going to go through and list all of these in detail. I just want to talk about them generally and um, starting with the logistical support that will be needed to make Lotus possible. You can imagine the challenges of siting and installation of 80 flux towers and five profiling nodes with multiple instrumentations associated with each. This could really be a logistical nightmare, but with new software developments, we're envisioning that we can facilitate the installation and the collection of the metadata and the setup of the instruments through automated and reprodu reproducible methods. So this would include automating and verifying and tracking things like instrument location and orientation and configuration, and inventory tracking and instrument recovery, and really everything pertaining to instrumentation setup and operations and maintenance. Um, the software would be developed to establish the networking infra infrastructure um, to enable the real-time data delivery monitoring. The creation of the integrated data sets are uh, so the data integration will be important for real-time visualization and monitoring and decision making about LIDAR scanning, for example, and potential UAS flights. It's also important for scientific analysis and for providing capabilities to users to really merge and optimize all of the Lotus data. On the right, what I'm showing is one example of how we integrated a few data sets from the PECON field campaign in 2015. The top left part of the figure shows the NEXRAD radar data network displaying radial velocity fields. We used that to define the orientation and the spatial extent of the low-level jet that displayed really strong low-level winds. 
use that to see the jet and going through western and central Kansas with the deep red colors depicting strong southerly flow associated with the low level jet. And then the three panels on the top right show profiling data embedded in the low level jet, including area potential temperature on top and Doppler LIDAR wind speed and Doppler LIDAR wind direction on the bottom. So you can see the strong wind speeds in purple centered at around um, 500 meters in the center panel. And the, um, the bottom three plots show the time series of the um, Radioson sequential launches. And um, a visualization and integration of similar combinations of the spatial and profiling information will be necessary for LOTUS. And I'll also talk about data assimilation aspects of these plans. So the real-time transmission of data will be an important aspect for the LOTUS data sets as well. This is necessary for monitoring the data and project decisions in real time and instrumentation, also for data assimilation activities. Um, so we can use those real time data perhaps for data quality checks and continuous data archival. Since we'll have some redundant information, we could use those data in real time to assess and verify and correct data amongst the instruments in real time so, um, so the slide from Gary with all those words on it really encompassed several major development efforts and um, we're looking for your input on Thursday if you can join us in the brainstorming session or any time to provide us input about your ideas on, on some of these tasks as, as well as others that you get inspired to think So this slide is another way to combine, as another example that we've done to combine data sets. This is from Pertigal, put together by Robert Menke, and he combined scanning Doppler LiDAR data from these four LiDARs that were located along the slopes of the terrain, um, shown schematically by the red dots in the upper right. So he took the scans from these multiple LiDARs and pieced it together to illustrate the uh, low level prominent wave structures over their terrain. It's much more powerful to combine instruments than to look at one instrument alone. This is a perfect example of that. The next slide is from Josh Gebauer, our brand new Lotus postdoc. Um, he provided an example um, that, that shows how to visualize integrated data set from a CLAMP system, which is an OU NSSL mobile profiling system. So this shows the combination of airy potential temperature in the top right, and then Doppler LiDAR um, vertical velocity in the center and Doppler LiDAR wind speed in the bottom. And so combined, this shows the full diurnal cycle of the boundary layer that Steve showed us about. And um, so if you start this time series starting at zero UTC, it starts with the evening transition period. And um, if, if this, these data are from central Oklahoma. Um, so the evening transition period occurs from zero UTC to 2.30 with a decreasing depth of the turbulent updrafts and downdrafts that you can see in the center panel. Um, and then from 0230 to about 1200 UTC, you can see the decreasing potential temperature from Airy that illustrates the development of the stable nocturnal boundary layer. And the development of the low-level jet also occurs during this time. Greater than 25 meter per second horizontal winds between about 500 meters and a kilometer. And then after 1200 UTC, the layer forms, which you can see from the growth of the strength and the depth But again, by combining these different data sets, you can learn a lot more about the, what's going on um, throughout the diurnal cycle. The next slide is from um, Jun Kim K, an EOL postdoc who has really done an exciting job of creating an OSI or observing system simulation experiment. His focus has been on using MPD to evaluate the observation impact of
Hey, Tammy, sometimes your audio is cutting out. You might change to the other microphone. Okay, I changed to the other microphone. Can you hear me? That's better for me, yeah. Okay, good, thanks, Steve. Um, okay, so this um, on the left, the flow chart on the left describes just basically the OSI framework. And um, this technique uses a numerical model to help us assess any potentially new instruments or any potentially new combination of, of existing instruments. So we can do this in the model world without actually putting the instruments out there and evaluating their impact in real life. We're doing this numerically. So what Jun Kyung did for MPD was he run a, run a model that we got that closely resembled what happened for a case study in reality. And we call that the nature run. And that's our truth in this Aussie framework. And then he simulated different data sets, including surface stations, radio sons, and MPD profiles. So he simulated these different data sets. They weren't real data sets, but he took those simulated data sets and assimilated those um, data sets into a new model run and compared the forecast with the nature run or the truth to determine the value of assimilated MPD data compared with surface stations and compared with radio sounds. And he found a positive impact of the MPD data. So we're really excited about those results. And next he'd like to add wind profiling data into the study to determine if there's an additional improvement to the forecast scale possible by adding the wind profiles um, along with the water vapor profiles. So as illustrated on the right, Jun Kyung would also like to add other of the planned and proposed Lotus instruments to determine the optimal combination of sensors for different science applications. And the next slide is also from Jun Kyung. And um, this shows the next slide. Can you hear me? <laughs> Oh, thanks, Terry. Okay, so this next slide shows how the same Aussie concept could be used also to inform a field campaign design. So we could put the Lotus nodes and um, spatially distributed flux towers in different locations in the domain, in different terrain regimes um, to, to determine the optimal location and spacing of the Lotus instruments. And then the next slide, which just shows another possible configuration in the same terrain. So we could do these multiple Aussie runs to help the PIs to determine the optimal setup to achieve their science objectives. All right, and the next slide shows how um, we might be able to use the numerical model also to help us create 3D fields of key variables after the data are collected. So also from June King, Jun Kyung put together the schematic to help us describe how this might work. So we could start with a gridded model domain um, shown here in this example of, from ECMWF. We could use this to create a short range forecast and that would be our first guess or the background field. Um, so what we can see here was the ECMWF grid with a coarse grid spacing domain and then a higher resolution nested grid shown by the dark blue in the foreground. foreground. It also shows a forecast fields of geopotential height in the light blue contours and forecasted clouds with their associated updrafts and downdrafts illustrated by the red arrows. The next slide shows that we would add Lotus data uh, via our real-time data assimilation. And then this, um, this slide depicts the um, new forecast geopotential height fields in orange contours and the new clouds locations in yellow. Um, so the, the data from Lotus could be used to um, modify the forecasts. And we can also use these um, data from Lotus um, and combined with the numerical model to spread the observational information to other variables through the correlation techniques. And then this will allow us to change the surrounding 3D model fields. 
So the combination of the models and the observations via data assimilation would let us create 3D fields for all of the important variables that we're interested in looking at in three dimensions, including um, what's shown here is geopotential height. And we could also get 3D fields of pressure and temperature and water vapor and winds and clouds and precipitation. So the next slide shows an actual example of a specific type of data assimilation from Josh. This is called the optimal estimation technique that has been created for airy retrievals following Dave Turner's creation of ARI OE, ARI, ARI Optimal Estimation. And here, um, Josh shows us how multiple profiling instruments could be combined together in the optimal estimation retrieval to provide additional constraints on the measured ARI radiances, which will let us improve the retrievals of temperature and water vapor. So this schematic shows us how we might combine ARI with microwave radiometer, MPD, and Doppler LiDAR. And this new version of ARI OE is called TROPE OE for tropospheric remotely observed profiling via optimal estimation. Um, so this combination, if we include VAD scans from the Doppler LiDAR, could provide for almost real time, like every five to 10 minute profiles of temperature, water vapor, and winds of the lower atmosphere. And then the last slide I wanted to show you is also from Josh, and this shows an example of TROPE OE um, that he put together using data from Pertigao. And he, um, so what it shows us on the left is a comparison between the airy only retrieval, just using the airy radiance information um, for the retrieval method. And that's compared with the radiosond data that are, is shown in black. So the airy retrieval does okay. Um, at low levels in temperature, um, but not so great with water vapor. However, when Josh added in the MPD and microwave radiometer data as additional constraints to the airy retrieval, the water vapor profile is improved dramatically. Um, so this work on TROPE-OE is continuing to find the best ways of leveraging the strengths of each of these profiling instruments and could also include um, model analysis fields as well. So that's just a brief overview of some of the ideas and concepts that we're thinking about for data issues with Lotus. It's really an exciting opportunity to think about how to create these new integrated observational capabilities with new developments in data deployment, data collection, data transmission, data archival, data visualization, data assimilation, and data analysis. Um, to think about. So we really encourage you to join us on Thursday for brainstorming sessions to help us to define the next steps. And now we go back to Terry, who's going to talk more about outstanding challenges in front of us. Great. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Tammy. I just, this is the final slide for our presentation. Um, but this is just a little bit of a summary of the many challenges that we have with uh, Lotus. Also listing, you know, what is the uh, goals that Steve and Tammy just talked about as far as what we're trying to do? And I think one of the key things to kind of point out is if you look at the Pertigal field program where we had almost all of EOL's ground-based instrumentation um, deployed, uh, plus all the users, uh, the partners in Pertigal, it was a very large suite of instrumentation. However, if you look at a lot of that, it was all very much individual sensors um, making measurements um, where it's up to the PIs to figure out how to combine all that data. If we look at Lotus, Lotus, we're really trying to go to the next generation of uh, ground-based uh, sensors and remote using in situ and remote um, sensors. So we have many uh, scientific uh, challenges from the standpoint we've listed uh, some of the key instruments that EOL uh, currently uses from the uh, flux towers, MPD, wind profilers, uh, wind LIDAR, but we really need to work with the user uh, community as far as really fine tuning uh, that instrument suite. Uh, so more from a scientific standpoint, you know, what is needed beyond just as far as how EOL perceives it. Uh, the other key thing that Tammy certainly talked about was, you know, 
uh, instead of having independent measurements, how do we start developing blended data products? This would certainly be working to uh, beyond just EOL as far as how do we do that? How do we get our data going into the um, models? Um, other uh, aspects of it is, is when you look at our remote sensors, such as the wind LIDAR, um, that can be put into very uh, multiple different types of modes from a, a BA, BAD to more of a uh, DBS beam scanning for wind profiling, but there's a lot of flexibility there. And can we develop algorithms that really go into dynamic scanning modes uh, such that our instrumentation is adaptive uh, to the environment? Uh, the other key thing, this is really coming back to um, the information that Gary Granger provided in Tammy's slides, uh, data integration, visualization, derived products, um, the diverse type of uh, uh, data products that we're having from in situ to uh, remote sensors. How do we start um, integrating that? How should we be integrating that? Um, if we look at the engineering side of all this, as far as with the large number of instruments, um, we really got to look at what's the manpower required to support such a field program. Uh, such as developing an autonomous operation, uh, complete remote control of the instrumentation, which is certainly both hardware, software engineering. Uh, same thing with the large number of sensors, instrumentation out there. It really has to be ruggedized, hardened instrumentation where there is not, uh, the maintenance level is pretty minimal during a field program. Um, other aspects certainly too, is if we look at the number of uh, where we'd have five nodes, five MPDs, five wind profilers, five wind abiders, um, uh, 80 uh, flux towers, 10 meter towers. Uh, what is engineering required to be efficient at that? Such as um, the recent acquisition of the 30 meter self-erecting towers is a good example of here's technology to use with uh, helping out and setup. A uh, big aspect of all this is certainly the data management. Um, we're gonna have a very large uh, data set if we look at uh, how we do data QC, archival, um, why we have many tools and automated tools, but to look at that from a big picture to say, from the ground up, uh, is there more efficient ways to do that? Should we be using artificial intelligence? Uh, certainly, the as I mentioned earlier, field logistics, uh, this is a large number of instrumentation going into the field. There are certainly many challenges we have there to be solved. And then the, um, Last key aspect that's very important is if you look at the expertise uh, more on the science data products uh, side and EOL by itself is not gonna be able to um, achieve all these goals of Lotus. So we're really looking at what are the other um, NCAR labs such as MQ in partnering up with them and certainly with the university community. Um, so Lotus has many challenges ahead of us um, but it's really looking to what's the whole next generation of ground-based um, instrumentation to support the university community. And with that, I would like to go ahead and again, thank Steve and Tammy uh, for their presentation and go ahead and switch over to questions. We are using Slido, so uh, please submit the uh, questions for, through Slido. We do have a large number in attendance, so we'd sure appreciate it. And we're very much open to any questions. Steve, you want to go ahead and uh, take the first one. Uh, let's see. <laughs> So, so the so this question is kind of um, what I was describing with the flights was mostly to try to define just the mean state um, and the temporal variability of of the volume. Uh, I wasn't necessarily saying that we had to to do aircraft fluxes from each one of those. The, in the box model, uh, the fluxes are what comes in and out of the sides of the box, not, not so much the in, 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 uh, what's going on inside. Uh, there is, and then it's actually an interesting question of 
how much of those flux, how much of that transport is just mean transport, transport, just the yeah the convergence and divergences you're talking about, um, and and how much might be turbulent. I, I don't actually know. Well, we're working on uh, calculations from the profilers for how you might be able to get a flux profile at, elevated and do that for different for different sides of the boxes. And continued. No, I, I so yeah, the, it, it, getting a good convergence divergence measurement is going to definitely be challenging because it's the usual um, trying to take the difference between two large values to get a small value. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons why I like uh, the, like the subdomains, trying to, if you can build with five nodes, uh, several different boxes, and then you can have some, some uh, checks on how good your convergence divergence measurements are. But yeah, good questions, John. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Um, other questions for the team? Uh, Tammy, you want to take this question? Yeah, thanks, Vivek. So the, qu the question is, uh, what is the role of the K-band radar in the instrumentation design right now? And that is to give us the observations of clouds. So we really wanted to have the capability of monitoring the, the, orient the distribution of clouds in the Lotus domain. So that is why the K-band radar is there at this point. We, it hasn't been well-defined yet as to the um, technical specifications of the K-band radar. We just know that we want to have that capability of measuring the clouds. Thanks, Tammy. Other questions? Steve, you got this one. Um, we definitely have thought about using um, Aussies and other possibilities to, to place the towers originally. Um, if, as far as adjusting things in real time, no, we haven't really had that much of a discussion. Um, of course, it's a fairly big deal to, to move in situ instrumentation, but uh, certainly things like a sampling strategy uh, could be if you had LIDARs or, or other thing, scanning devices, you could just a, a scan, sampling strategy that would be uh, useful to consider doing in real time. Questions, engineering questions, logistics questions for us. University um, partnerships. I think one of the key things I want to throw out too that we had listed was the UAS. Um, I certainly don't see EOL being in the business of actually operating um, UAS at the moment. Uh, and yet there are several universities that are operating um, U various uh, versions of UAS. CU is doing sig significant work with fixed wing, OU with more of the quad um, copter. But if you look at the gap in our sensory uh, measurements between the in situ towers on the surface and our remote sensors, there's a gap to fill. So UAS would fit into that quite nicely. And that would be a good example where uh, for VOTUS, uh, to develop these uh, partnerships. Uh, Jackie, thanks for your question. What is the timeline or expectations for Lotus? Um, that's a great question. I think one of the key things is, is the long-term goal is for Lotus to become part of the LOAF. 
um, from that standpoint. Uh, we have certainly been pursuing um, funding with the um, NSF MSRI uh, that we attempted. Um, on that, the other key thing is if you look at, we have activities taking place with the NCAR boundary layer group that uh, Steve is a part of. With a lot of that information that um, Steve is working in there certainly feeds directly into what are the needs um, for VOTUS uh, from that standpoint. And if we also look at um, one of the key things when we talk about field logistics, you know, what needs to be done to try and streamline um, processes, if we look at least in ISF, uh, from the standpoint where we just received the uh, 30 meter self-erecting towers, that's a good example of the technology for us to um, certainly explore right now today, but that would be something we'd be expecting to use for VOTUS um, when we have a large suite of instruments. Same thing if you look at MPD, MPD is really meant to be have autonomous um, operation. So we're kind of taking small steps right now as far as the um, uh, moving towards uh, VOTUS with what's currently taking place um, in EOL. Um, the question is, is this really in the concept phase? I think from the standpoint of the five nodes, and I'd love Steve or Tammy to uh, jump in or anybody else, concept uh, phase, I think, you know, the next step, what we're really looking at is working with the university community to present um, through our white paper, uh, through hopefully in the springtime to have a uh, workshop with the broader community to really refine as we envision VOTUS. Um, and that includes all the instrumentation that we'd be um, covering. So hopefully I answered most of your questions there. I guess I could just jump in, Terry, just to, I mean, yes, you're, as you say, it's kind of a mixed concept and, and prototyping phase right now because we are making progress on various science questions, various questions that we know about. As I think I, also at some point we, of course it de depends a lot upon input from, from this group, um, but we had talked about a three-year proposal to build once we had an approved project and sufficient depth, sufficient funds. So in my mind, it's it's on the order of a five-year uh, time to completion from where we are now. But just to give an order of magnitude. Okay. Other questions, comments on MODIS? Um, so, I'll, Steve, you can either answer it, or I thought I more or less answered it, but go ahead, Steve, you, why don't you add to my answer? Um, yeah, I, if, yes, we're considering using UASs. I think that would be really cool and, and interesting and, and a novel use of, of that, of UASs, and, but yes, you're right that, um, we would do that as a collaborative partnership. Hmm. Uh, great question, um, Carol. Um, I don't have a good answer on the exact ideas for data visualization as far as um, how we would approach that. And I would say, Steve or Tammy, if you want to um, maybe try and answer uh, Carol's question. And I think this would be one of the questions too, where working with the community uh, would be very critical in trying to determine that. Yeah, um, Carol, thanks. This is a really good question. And it's something that we're putting a lot of thought into and the options, the opportunities for this area are really huge and exciting and um, wide open. So we really do encourage ideas for us to help to create these capabilities of data visualization and integration and ways to just merge all the, blend all the data, merge it all, integrate it all and bring it together so that we can help to get one complete picture of the atmosphere. Um, so one method is probably going to be through data assimilation capabilities, but there's also going to be just the requirement for us to build a tool to integrate all of these different disparate data sets into one package. 
And just to a little bit to follow on, Carol, as you as you know, we're trying to figure out how to get data um, in a format that modelers deal with it. And I'm hoping that part of that will be to leverage some of the visualization tools that modelers have already developed for 3D data. And uh, if we can get our data in that kind of format, then that should be that should help. But as Tammy says. The, the questions wide open and we want your input about, along with everyone else. <laughs> uh, great question, Kurt. You are absolutely um, correct as far as the magnitude with uh, uh, current staff. I certainly see a increase in staff over what we currently have. However, I would look at it to be hopefully just more a small incremental um, increase in staff. And I think this is one of the key things where we certainly have to be looking at the newer um, technologies to explore to say, how do we minimize the staff? Um, in addition to deploying the, the instrumentation, the other key thing is also the O&M, when we're not in the field with this large number of instrumentation, um, you know, what is required there? And that's where I'm, one of my challenges I put in, in how we have to harden and ruggedize um, our equipment where we get. So the, from a staff standpoint, it's both what we're doing out in the field and um, back home um, in the labs with everything. Uh, some of the other key things uh, too, at least on the O&M side, if you look at the calibration lab where we're doing a major rewrite of all the software. A lot of that is just to, uh, for the calibration of in-situ sensors to automate and simplify the processes that we have currently um, been doing from that standpoint. Um, if you look at MPD, they've uh, Scott Spiller and his team have worked very hard as, as far as minimizing the um, uh, operations from uh, minimizing the staff out in the field as far as what it's uh, required to support MPD. And we really got to start using that same philosophy uh, that they're working on with both things with um, our equipment uh, and ISF. And as we look to all new instrumentation. So a lot of it, I guess, to answer your question is, is we really got to be exploring new technologies, uh, new uh, approaches as far as how we're going to um, deploy this magnitude of uh, instrumentation. And I certainly do consider that one of the larger um, uh, challenges that we have with Lotus. So great question, thank you. Um, Jan, on the EOL scientists, I don't believe we sent it to all EOL scientists. It's been a little bit random within terms of EOL. Um, we did send it to um, science, select scientists outside of um, EOL, but uh, I can certainly get you access um, to the white paper and we'd certainly love your uh, feedback. Uh, Greg, thanks for a great question. We're going to also consider this the um, last question here. We got about one minute left. And as far as how our users work with the Lotus data, I think this is going to come back again to you know the workshop uh, or a, um, uh, working with the community um, to get a little bit more of their uh, feedback. I think one of the other key things is more from your group, Greg, as far as need to get input on your end um what you see because it also ties into the whole archiving if you look at these large uh data sets so you know from a standpoint of how we develop how we design lotus there is a significant amount more of work more on the technical um aspects certainly along with the scientific aspects um so you're a little bit ahead of the game as far as your question and i greatly appreciate it so thank you greg i wish i had a good answer for you um with that said, our uh, time is about up. I wanna say thank you to everyone who uh, joined us. I greatly appreciate uh, your time. I wish you all a good day. And I did send an email out to several of you as far as more of a brainstorming session uh, for this Thursday afternoon to try and get more uh, interactive uh, input 
and thoughts on the many challenges of Lotus. Again, thank you all for attending. I greatly appreciate it. I wish you all a good day. Thanks.